Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Clifton Literary Festival, in case you weren't clear where you were. And um, I hope you've all had a really good lunch, because if you haven't, we're going to drive you insane with hunger, actually, for the next hour or so. Well, this morning, some of us were talking about um, Jewish history, and Jewish history, it's often been said, can be summed up as, they tried to kill us, they failed, now let's eat. Um, and um, the eating part is a much happier part. And um, it lets me celebrate 30 years of one of my favorite places in the world, if not the most favorite place, certainly the, the eating place where I feel most at home. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm an enthusiastic but not invariably successful cook. I was a um, cookery writer at GQ for a number of years. And that's the River Cafe, 30 years on. And uh, the presiding genius now of the River Cafe, um, an alchemist of happiness, is Ruth Rogers, my beloved friend. So it, this is Ruth's hour. Come and take it, Ruth. Um, so we're going to... Always kiss your interviewer, right? Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's me. As long as it's me. Yes, yes, always kiss the interviewer. Um, so 1987, 30 years ago, tell us um, how it started and what the food world was like there and why you, you know, if you, if you casually thought you'd start a restaurant anytime, anywhere, people would try and dissuade you. So, yeah. 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 I think that um, it started, can you hear me? It started with a site and uh, Richard, uh, my can husband. you all hear? Sorry, we do that can inevitable you thing. You can. Yeah, can you okay. hear? Mike's so my husband good. is a, an architect, and we were living in Paris, and we came back and thought about where would we work, where would we uh, continue and create a practice after having uh, done this time in Paris. And we, he and his partners found these dilapidated warehouses in Hammersmith that were it was really, at that time particularly, it still is a bit of a trek to get there, but at that time particularly, it was really, um, it was out of, out, out of sight. We once had a customer, in fact, I would say, <laughs> who asked, we asked her where she was going, and she said London, and she wanted a cab. <laughs> but it's better now. So he found this site, and the site had the view of the river, it had the potential for community, which is really he wanted. And it had the potential for somewhere to eat because mm -hmm. both of us love food. He wanted it to be a place where his team could eat. And, and uh, we were looking, I mean, it's a very short story. We were looking at applications for restaurants that wanted to go in that very small space. It only had nine tables, three windows. And we thought the only thing worse than not having a place to eat would be a mediocre place to eat. And in one of those moments, I said, you know what, I think I'll do it. And so Rose, my partner, had just come back from, she was also working in Italy, living in Italy. And both of us were inexperienced. She had a tiny bit more than I did. And we went and looked at the space, and we said, let's do it. So it was small. Mm. There were restrictions, which I think really helped, you know, having those restrictions. Talk, talk about that. those a bit. Because well, first of all, the space was very small. Uh, when we applied to the council to have a restaurant there, although there was no uh, chance of our, in, in, you know, intruding on the neighborhood, they made very. They said we could only be open at lunchtime. We could only be open to the people who worked there, and we could only open between <laughs> Monday and Friday. So, uh, in a way, you know, it was, it was impossible. Really. Why did because, they hate food so much? Well, I think the they, council. <laughs> I how think, many of you, by the way, how many of you know the cafe have been there? Yeah. Oh, oh boring. Boring, <laughs> so it's family. <laughs> okay, it's all right, family. good. good. It's so why, why do they give you I such a hard time? I think there was. I think there was a real fear of. I don't know. Somebody who is, I'm an American. T explained to me why there were Duckham's oil warehouses. There was, you know, there were fumes. Mm. There were cans. There were deliveries. It was a mess. You couldn't see the river. And then Richard came in and said, "We'll put a garden. We'll let the community mm. use it." They'll, We'll have parking. We'll have uh, you know nice spaces, and they didn't like it. You know, they, yeah. they thought, it's a fatal mistake no, no, to suggest no, 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 yes no, to suggest no, no. improvements no, and happiness. Yeah, yeah. 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 big so, mistake. But you, I, know. you know, you and I might not. Have, but the, yeah. the um, so it became it just we we just had to. As a matter of fact, they actually had a petition 
Um, they raised a petition saying that the River Cafe would be, they were opposed to it because it would bring down the tone of the neighborhood. So, <laughs> um, so that's where we started. But that was okay because, as I said, Rose would make sandwiches, I would make a pasta, I would make a pasta, Rose would make sandwiches. And we, you know, as neither of us really, dare I say, knew what we were doing, um, except that we were, we were also really ambitious from the very start mm. that we wanted to have a great Italian restaurant. Was that part of, I mean, uh, Beth Rose had lived in Italy for a while, I think. She mm. bought a house in yeah, Tuscany. Luca, yeah. And of course, Richard, Richard grew up in Italy. Yeah, so, Richard's parents um, were Yeah, so how much did all that... There was no doubt um, when we started talking that we wanted to do a restaurant with Italian food. Um, we wanted to have a restaurant where, you know, a lot of the people, <coughs> part, there were a lot of other ideas about participation, about... Uh, seasonality, regionality, but we wanted, we always knew we both wanted to do Italian food. And that was because that's how I, I mean, I lived in Paris over a market. I grew up in upstate New York. Uh, but it was really Richard's mother, who's Italian. And when I understood that kind of cooking, I knew it was the food I mm. wanted to cook. Mm. And I think the problem in London at the time was that a lot of Italian restaurants that had opened were opened by waiters and managers. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't really chef-led. And so mm. we thought, why can't you have the Papa Pomodoro? You can have the Ribolito, mm. or you can have those the, the veg just boiled vegetables with good olive oil. Mm. And so that's what we wanted yeah. to do. Now, I mean, there, there was a great uh, you know, layer of... Uh, it, it, one shouldn't be too snooty about red sauce Italian, really. I no, mean, that, not at all. No. And you have wonderful... No. The, the yeah. perfect Ruthie and Rose bread sauces and the famous Papa Pomodoro. Um, because actually, they were when I was working as a kind of um, stressed out, sweaty graduate student at the British Museum, there was a little place called the Trattoria Alpino in New Yorkshire yeah. Street. Yeah. yeah, and actually, it was a sort of godsend. It was, uh, um, and they were what they were definitely one stage up from simply, uh, you know, spag bowl and vongole things, actually. But it's true, even that we now, partly because of you, you know, take for granted something that can be sophisticated but not fussy, really. Yeah. That's the sort of essence of it. And um, so I guess if you go back to 1987, were there any, you know, um, I hate the word authentic, but I'm going to use it anyway, authentic yeah, Italian I, restaurants I, that I had in San London. I don't know San Lorenzo. The thing... Oh, I San Lorenzo, maybe. That's right. I don't yeah, know, but yeah. and probably there are other Mediterranean. San Lorenzo Mer was in Beach and Place. Was it Meridiana? Was it? But I think that what, what we all loved about those restaurants, whatever it was, is that what you were just describing, is that you went in, it was fun, it was noisy, that mm. they were relaxed, that they kind of loved you being there. And there was always that slight choice would you go and have, in a great atmosphere, maybe not very good food, but you had a good yeah. time, or would you get dressed up, have a shower, be frightened, and humiliated? by the sommelier and have and eat well. And so I think Rose and I, it wasn't just us though, there was Sally Clark, there was Roly Lee, there was so yeah. Alice Walters, Wolfgang Puck, who were all thinking, let's do really good food, but have a very democratic kind of nice time. Yeah, you know, we don't yes. have a dress code. And so it was. I think one thing not to, um, well, go on to some of the elements that, uh, you know, made from the beginning and still do make River Cafe you know, unique, not, not a word one shouldn't use lightly. Um, but um, can I just say a bit, can I ask you a bit more about the, um, you know, what it meant to create that open space? Because actually yeah. light, actually also, you know, in, in the mm -hmm. fine weather, which you, you know, used to be in 1987, like two days a year, and now it's like 350 yeah. <laughs> days of the year. Now really Italy has come yeah. to Thameside. Thank you, global warming. But I mean, yeah. that was a, that's, a, did you, did that you That is all credit to Richard and yeah. his team. That when they did wanted, you do that, Because they could have put, well, you know, most people would put, if you were developing a site, you'd put another building there because, yeah. you know, why not? But I think that he really wanted to have this sense of community. They wanted to have a face that if you were working on a drawing all day that you could actually go outside. Mm. And it's the same thing. I've often, you know, working in a restaurant is quite tough, tough. isn't it, Julian? <laughs> so, you know, it is, you can see that it is, it is stressful. But the idea that if you are having a bit of a bad day or a bad time, that we just sometimes say, just go out, just go outside and get some air, go outside and look mm. at the view. And also it becomes a place where people, before they come to eat, will go in the green space, as you say. Yeah. And the most important thing is that on a Sunday, you basically cannot even begin to go there because there are so many children. And yeah. children take it over. You just have no choice. The children are there, cutting down our plants, you know, putting a football in our 
Franz Turbot or whatever, you know, but that's their space and they use it and they enjoy it. Well, I tell you what, teach them it. to cook and then mm, they can have yeah, their own little in, yeah. annex. But it's so nice them. for the parents to sit there and have yeah. a meal and know their kids are happy. So the green space is crucial. It's, yeah. it's very, very important yes. to us. Um, when you when you start, can, can you say a bit about um, uh, this book? By the way, actually, uh, is gorgeous, and I like. Yeah, <laughs> there is a signing. We're both doing a signing. You'll want, you'll want um, Ruthie's book, but it, it is the, the the books have always been gorgeous. Um, the River Cafe books and a lot of attention, as Ruth says, and lovely forwards to colour. Uh, it's full of art. Um, deriving from Albers's wonderful font and um, the kind of designs that, um, uh, that Ellsworth Kelly provided. But um, can, you say, can you say a bit about um, uh, the sort of um, the, uh, Botaga features? Was Botaga really kind of around 1987? I mean, mm. there, there, you know, there were certain things that no, were... No, it was a struggle. We used to actually bring... Stuff like that. Read, I mean, Botaga is one thing, but, you know, we... Well, it's a grey mullet it's row, a It's a row of the yeah. grey mullet yeah. from, from Sardinia. And we used to bring, but we used to bring back, you know, famously Rose brought a pumpkin back from Italy once and they wouldn't, there wasn't a seat, so we always say the pumpkin went business and Rose went economy, you know. But <laughs> we used to bring things back. We used to, Richard and I used to bring back Parmesan. We used to buy prosciutto, uh, San Daniele, which you couldn't get. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things, in, when the first book was done, Rose and I would go on, on book tours, and the questions always would be at the end of the session, it's all very well for you to put salted anchovies, but where are we going to get them? It's all yeah. really well for you to put yeah. targa. And now, um, those questions don't appear because of, you know, the internet. You can go online and mm. buy food and order it. And I also think that a lot of people traveled, and I think if you travel, you know, for, I don't like to condemn too much British food before, you know, this revolution. Because I think Britain came out of a war, and it came out of rationing, and it came out of a real struggle of getting ingredients, getting food. And I think that to just say it was all of us who changed British cooking and it was so horrible before mm. um, is not fair. So I think that when, when there was possibility of traveling, people went to France, they went to Italy, they ate in trattorias, they had a certain kind of food. They came back as adventurous eaters, you know, and I think mm. that really, I mean, don't you find that people, when you travel, people often say not so much, what did you see, but what did you eat? Where did you go? Mm. Because it does tell you about the culture of a city. If you go mm. to the market, it tells you about mm. that. So. I don't know if, uh, um, you know, I was... Uh, definitely turned on in the 60s by Elizabeth David's books. Yeah. And in actually my first book, well, first book I think was French Provincial Cooking and second book was, um, was Italian Cooking. And there you had those wonderful narratives of discovery, mm. really, and she mm. became a kind of ethnographer, mm. not just of regions, yeah. but of places that have only just arrived and places that have been there for many, many generations. So she was someone who made in the 1960s in Cambridge finding a battery de cuisine, yeah. you know, yeah. those first Le Creuset yeah. pots yeah. possible. So I want to talk to you about, because you weren't there in the, in the 1960s, but tell me about, um, you know, food and Ruthie when you were growing up. And, yeah. and because both Rose and you were not trained cooks. I, I can't no. actually think, apart from the people you've trained, um, it's quite conspicuous how many yeah. brilliantly successful yeah. cooks were not trained in a formal yeah. way. Well, that's tell another me, story. That's about Yeah, tell educating. me about you and food. But I grew up in a very small town in upstate New York, and my mother was a librarian, a teacher, my father was a doctor. And I think that, uh, again, we grew up with restrictions, so there wasn't a lot. But we mm. always ate well. We ate simply, as I say, like probably your family, uh, my family, food, getting around the table is about talk, sometimes more than food. We were all talking, talking, talking. But my mother, they were careful, and especially, I would say, in the summer, um, when we had corn, if you just always take corn, you know, and we always said if you were having corn at lunch, you bought it in the morning, and if you had corn at dinner, you bought it in the afternoon. So there was that feeling of what mm. was fresh. But we didn't eat out. It was a very different... Um, culture. We didn't. Um, we went to restaurants for special occasions, and it was probably the. Mm. When I see the way people eat in the River Cafe with their children and breakfast and lunch and dinner, my children go out all the time. So it was a different culture, but it was. It was really thinking about food around the table and what you would mm. eat and what you would cook. And I think I just was 
I just love to eat, and I loved good food. And I think if you love to eat... Was your eat, mother a good cook? Cool. Uh, my brother's sitting there. I would say yes. Yeah, she was good. <laughs> no. Brother no. is uh, <laughs> doing that. Like, I think she, I will depend, she was a good cook. What was she, she, was, what was she good at? I think she made really simple American food that you had, yeah. you know. Um, at the end of the day, she worked all day, so she would come back, and she would make us... You know, pasta one night and chicken the next night, but it was careful and it was, mm. it was you know, we had fresh vegetables and nothing from cans and so really? it was okay. good. Yeah, she was good. And um, and then I think if you love to eat, which I did, do you then have a choice? If you have enough money, somebody else can cook for you. You can go out, but otherwise, you learn to cook, don't you? You mm. learn. You need to learn how to make delicious food. And so I grew up with that. And then in college we were cooking. When I moved to London we were cooking. But the real real teacher for me was Richard's mother, who was an Italian um, who came to London during the war. And she'd grown up in Florence and Trieste. And so, mm. you know, what I always thought about Dada's food was that you could recognize it. You know, you mm. always knew whether it was her carrots or whether it was a risotto that... It was hers, and that, say a bit more about great. that, or can you? Can well, you? she, as a, you know, she, she, we go, you know, being good Italian children, we were there. I mean, there's no question, we were there every Sunday lunch, and mm. usually probably one or two times during the week. And um, again, we ate in, and she was, she became. Richard said, or she said, she used to cook with butter, and then suddenly she decided that butter was the worst thing you could have. So we used mm. to have everything, you know. She's evangelical about no butter, um, but. Her risottos, you know, everything had a very strong taste. She used to make, she taught me how to make pork cooked in milk, you know, with yeah. the, the, that you cooked it long enough with the lemon and you had the curd. She made ice creams. I used to say Richard designed the house so that you could go from Wimbledon Common through this kind of courtyard into the, through the house and into the garden. But I used to go from Wimbledon Common to the car park, or park the car into the fridge. Because you would open her fridge and there would be, there would be tiny little bows of a bit of salsa verde or carrots or mm. beans. And so, and she didn't, you know, she didn't use herbs. She, she was very quite triestine, I think. She I, I was just going to ask yeah, you about the more, triestine It was part. more, so I think, A lot of braising. And, a lot of braising, yeah. a lot of slow mm. cooking. I don't think she, she made a lot of tomatoes, tomato sauce, risottos, uh, mushrooms. But she didn't, she didn't make a lot of the... Tuscan food that we cook now. Not grilling in Trieste, really. No, no grilling, the Austrian, no, yeah. no grilling, no, never, no. no. Yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> Actually, you know, in Italy, so many people never use ovens, do they? You know, no. I, I, she used to say, and people say that you go into an Italian kitchen of sort of 20 years ago, and there were just hot plates, you know, yeah. and that people would just cook everything on the top of the stove. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, say a bit more, because we all miss her, you very acutely. Um, say a bit more about Rose Gray. Rose Gray, what, where do I start? Yeah. You know, Rose was, she was a force, you know. She, she was um, brought up in, in Box Hill, sort of suburb, I guess, of, of uh, London. Her father, grandfather, I think, was president of the Royal Horticultural Society. Oh, so it couldn't be more different in a way. You know, Rose would find the one raspberry growing. You know. So how did you two become she, friends in the first? Because you did go back yeah, to the late 60s, yeah, she, didn't well, you? She, when I first came to London in 69, I met Rose. And she had been a friend of Richard's. She and Richard oh, went to okay. um, art college, I think, when they were 17. So I always knew Rose. But then, you know, I moved to Paris. She moved to Italy. Her children were very good friends with Richard's children. And um, then she... She was always passionate about cooking. And actually, there's a really beautiful page in here with drawings when she was in Italy of her drawings of the pasta machines. And if mm. you saw them, they're really about how to make pasta. And I think she spent a lot of time in, in Tuscany researching, cooking, possibly writing a book. And uh, then Nell uh, Campbell was a very close friend of hers. And she opened that club in New York called Nell's. Oh, yeah. And Nell yeah. said, Rose, you know, come and do this with me. Mm. And she did. And so she had, she said she was taught to run a restaurant by the kitchen porters, you know, in, in Nell's. And she came back and she really was ambitious about doing a restaurant. But we were both, that was the sum of her experience. She was really a great gardener and she was a great teacher. She had actually taught up, but I, you know, the way she taught people in the kitchen was mm. inspiring, you know, and very careful. Um, she didn't have much of a filter, so 
She would say <laughs> what she said, but you know, this. She was woman, scary, let's face not it. Not really. She no, was, no, yeah, well, no. not to you, maybe. I would say, she yeah, was, she was. Maybe. She was magnificent, she was magnificent but scary. You yeah. know, but scary. Was, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I used to sometimes follow her, and I said in the introduction, I used to follow her into a restaurant and say, uh, Rose didn't really mean that when she <laughs> criticized somebody. But then I realized, actually, she did, you know, so there was no point in, uh, in covering up for her. And her loss is, you know, yeah. is an, uh, uh, but, it, but on the other hand, I have to say, not on the other hand, but I would say that she's there, you know, she just so many times I tell somebody to grate the Parmesan cheese with that side of the grater or to cook that tomato sauce longer or, you know, to put the frito in sooner. And I know that somehow Rose is, you know, she's there. Yeah, she's you have the feeling there. she's there and that, mm. yeah, and she's yeah. looking on and making sure. Um, yeah, there is, they're wonderful. There are so many wonderful, I, I want to say quite a bit more about this beautiful and lovable book. It's a mm. lovable book, appropriate for River Cafe. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about why I think it is and why you're, you know, River Cafe cooking is in a bit. But tell me a bit more about, um, you know, whether you, apart from simply saying, well, it's going to be an Italian restaurant, but as we've said, Italian restaurants are wonderful because you would have a good time, they were loud, you know, they got to know your first name, you got to know their first name, but, you know, but, but, but. And then, then it was very uh, sort of, so I suppose that was a bit of San Lorenzo, kind of exquisitely, we are not red, Oh, we are not yeah. only red, mm -hmm. um, and we are really mostly white, and um, in that way. And you, so you really did. I was, you know, if I had to explain to somebody from another planet, I would say intensity of mm. of flavour, actually, which mm. comes from freshness, but also comes from never overdoing things, uh, particularly. And um, short of actually having. Italy somehow an Italian horticulture land in West London. It's the closest you can get to mm. actually having a kind of really intensely just mm. cooked experience. I mean, and that may be a slightly pretentious way of describing it. I was wondering whether you and Rose set out with a clear or even a vague sense of wanting, you know, maybe it was about yeah. bringing all that stuff back on I think planes it was, and cars. Yeah. And I think it was about the ingredient, yeah. you know, that we... Um, from the very, very beginning, you know, we would, we, we sourced the ingredients. So yeah. we fished, the, the fish that we bought was, you know, just off British waters, that we, um, we knew the vegetables that we wanted from the Milan market. We knew that we wanted to have, you know, the olive oil. We were very, even sea salt, you know, mold and mm. sea salt. Um, I think somebody once wrote a piece saying you must use mold and sea salt. Um, but it was just the idea that, that we, we could stand by whatever we did and whatever we cooked and whatever we served mm. but, and the prices we, we charged for the whatever it was if we had the ingredient and then mm. we didn't mess it up. And that's what started it, whether it was a piece of sourdough bread, you know, I mean, this doesn't sound pretentious, but with sourdough bread with just a small amount of garlic and extra virgin olive oil. And, and, and griddle it. Then, you, know, was, you know, you don't yeah. need, but if the bread isn't the right bread and the garlic isn't the right garlic and the oil isn't the right oil, then you need to put stuff on top of it. Then you say, mm. well, let's put some, you know, tomatoes or let's put some more cheese or let's put something else. And it's the same way with a piece of grilled fish. I'm not saying that we don't do fish or meat and slow cook it and put red wine in, but it's always kind of respecting and being mm. able to identify the ingredient. I don't mind, I love going to Paris where you have, you know, the fish and then you have the spinach and then you have the beurre blanc and then mm. you have, the, you know, it's divine. But for us, we just wanted to, and I think that's what we, and then as we started very Tuscan, because as I said, Rose lived in Italy, my, you know, my learn, teaching was from that. But the more we met the people who produced our wine, and that went from mm. Piemonte to Sicily, then we started traveling around, then we started eating in homes of mm. the wine growers, and that really influenced us a lot. Mm. Um, how about um, regionality, really? I mean, uh, mm. I know, Big Tuscan influence, yeah. but um, I mean, it sounds really stupid, but um, when I went to Sicily for the first time, I was very surprised how, I mean, it shouldn't have been, that's why I say it sounds stupid, you know, sophisticated it was, and yeah. Arab influences, yeah. and ancient Spanish yeah. influences, yeah. and Greek influences, yeah. like the architecture. Yeah. So there is this extraordinary kind of mosaic of. Well, Italy, I think, you know, only became, you know, the date, 18, when it became unified. Yeah. Um, and I think that, 
you know, I say it goes city, to, you know, region to region, city to city, town to town, family to family, and I say sometimes sister to sister, you know, how they want to make something. And I, um, I remember when I was in Montepulciano, I was going to do a pork in the wood oven. We were there in the summer, and I said, he said to me, the butcher, how are you going to make that? And I said, Huh, you're talking to a chef. Don't think, you know, I'm some <laughs> British tourist. And he said, I said, I'm going, to put, I'm going to put sea salt and I'm going to put rosemary and some fennel. And he went, oh, that's what they do in Siena. <laughs> and that we were talking about 50 miles away, you know, if that, you know. And that regionality, that, that idea that, uh, you know, we all think that tomato pasta is all over Italy, don't we? Yeah. And then I met a woman in Verona who said she hadn't had it till she went to Naples. I think... All of that is changing, but it is, mm. the, and maybe it's the same possibly in France and possibly here that you'd eat something in Lincoln, but it, that you wouldn't eat in somewhere else, you know, Cornwall. But I do think that Italy is particularly regional, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yes, yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, is it eat much, eat, you know, with the, as it were, borough marketization, not a word? I mean, easier, you, you don't have to be quite so you know, far-flung yeah. in sources, or are you still really... We have very, very few, we have very few suppliers, actually. If you look at our mm. diary, we have the suppliers for our vegetables that we've worked with for, you know, 20 years. Mm. So, you know, somebody will come to the door, which is very nice, because we change the menu twice a day and say, I have some porcini, you know, do right. you like them? But generally, we buy from two fish fishermen, right. one in Dorset, one in Devon. We buy from one butcher... I mean, again, if somebody comes and says, well, I've got grouse, we'll do it, but because we're able to be flexible. But um, we don't buy from a lot of people. Right. You know, and the only thing that's really imported, uh, flown in, is the mozzarella from Naples and then the vegetables. We couldn't, we couldn't live on the, um, or cook with the British range of vegetables in the winter, for instance. So yeah. we do rely on the Milan market, but yeah. we're very fussy about what we take. So you have, you have mozzarella flown in every day from Naples, so you have someone Not every day, but we have had city. times when people would think, now we do it through Natura, which is a really good right. um, supplier. But in the old days, yeah, they used to say, we've got a box of mozzarella, we're stuck at Heathrow. Right. You know, what can we do? But it's, it's become, that's the exciting thing about being a chef now, and being, yeah. you know, cooking at home, is that you can, you know, obtain mm. ingredients. That's something about about the book. When you, as you, we're not going to let you out till you buy a copy each. We did tell you that, right? Um, this is very, very home cooking friendly, isn't it? Actually, yeah. there are very few recipes in here. No, um, there are a lot of very famous cooks, my friends, um, who you know, you open the page at random. There's some gorgeous photo, yeah. and when you get to the twenty eighth ingredient, yeah. really thing, you know, life too short. And these are. So, there's one that has two, I think, which is the blood orange strawberry. I think he has just uh, well, blood orange and sugar, maybe. Oh, blood orange? They, they might not buy it if we tell them that. But um, it, is, it is very... We, we, a lot of these recipes come from the Blue Book. Um, half yeah. of them. The publisher actually approached us and said, you're going to be 30. Why don't we visit, revisit the Blue Book, which was done in 1994? And um, it, was, it was really interesting to do that because only half of them are, and the other half are new ones. Right. But the... Um, there were recipes, the way we cooked in 94, maybe we used more garlic, maybe we, um, you know, used a bit too much olive oil, maybe, well, especially the nemesis was in maybe the wrong size cake tin, but it wasn't actually, it was all right. But right. the, so we revisited these recipes and decided which ones stood the test of time, which ones needed to be changed, and uh, then the new ones that mm. we did. And um, we wanted to make a happy book, too. You know, yeah, we wanted I, it to be... I think you, you, a cookbook is a manual. You know, you follow it, you read instructions, but we wanted it to be also something that no, was beautiful. It feels like being there, which is, which is a wonderful thing. So, yeah, tell us about... Uh, and we're never going to... I'd have to tie you up, and even then it wouldn't work, um, to get the, the famous salted caramel ice cream out of your Oh, the chair. ice cream, caramel, that's You're not going to tell us, I are you? No, I will, of course I will. The, the oh. trick to the Why caramel... Why didn't I ever get it right? I mean, Look, Well, because me, you probably don't me. cook the sugar and um, do, caramelize it. You have to enough. almost... I, I wanted to say, I was almost... I had, I had at one point I had an introduction saying, when you think you're actually going to die then take the sugar off, you know, because <laughs> they would, the publisher would let me. But it is so toxic that the you, your cook, publisher, yeah. you cook the sugar and the caramel, and then you think it's dark. 
but then you have to take it one step and then another step further because you have to just remember you're adding all that yeah. liquid into it and mm -hmm. so it has to be so so dark there's no salt in it it's just purely right. um, sugar and water the right. caramel but you don't but have it in the when book, you come, we you? take it outside sometimes and do it. Yeah, it's in there. Oh, it is in there. Yeah. Oh, I missed oh, it. Yeah, yeah, oh, God, yeah, I yeah. missed it. Sorry. So, so. And uh, silly me. Um, and chocolate nemesis, how did that? We all want to know about that. I think I mean, that's it's pretty in, easy to make, actually. Yeah. It's fine. How did you? Um, I mean, that is right, one Charles, of the Charles greatest hits. Charles made it. Hits, it. Made it. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. Um, it is, I think that in the first book, perhaps, um, we didn't cook it long enough. Maybe. No. Oh, is <laughs> so, that right? I okay. think it does. In this book, we've told you to cook it longer. Um, we then discovered that if you put a cloth underneath the tin, between the tin, there's some hints, you know, between the mm. tin and the um, pan. But it actually, the main thing is to have the right size tin. And again, in 1994, we, it was hard to get that. Rose and I bought that tin in New York at Dean and DeLuca and brought it back. And I think that was one of the problems, that people made it in smaller tins and it kind of poured yeah. over and stuff. But this one works. Yeah. Um, what, uh, tell, tell me something. What do you feel? Do, do you think there has been... I can never quite decide, you know, whether or not there has been a revolution of... I mean, this book should do it. In, in cooking at home. Mm. And people are cooking with their kids. I mean, mm. I was very proud of... I felt the main thing to do, apart from keeping them out of harm's way with my children in growing up in Boston and then in New York was to teach them to cook. Yeah. Um, this, this, this could be a bit unfortunate. We, I succeeded in that. My son is a wonderful bread baker, vegetarian. My daughter's a very mm. good cook. So that worked. In fact, my son's admissions essay for university was in search of the perfect polpitone meatloaf oh, with his dad. Nice. And yeah. And uh, he, nice. it did the trick. He, he was, got it. Yeah. But, there was, but I, I, I'm just digressing a bit because actually this was clearly not necessarily an advantage because my daughter, who has been sort of brilliant at everything, when she was about seven or something we, or six, we were called in to buy the, um, you know, the headmistress of the primary school who said, but, you know, we love Chloe, but we're really worried about, we're really quite worried about her. And, um, and we thought, why? And she said, well, you know, motor control. We thought terrifying thing and um and and i said why was that she said well you know sometimes we have games and we throw a ball at her and she just stands there and it hits her in the face and uh, she said what happens when you throw a ball at her and we thought ah oh, throwing a ball actually <laughs> say, but but she <laughs> she knows how to make pasta we said that didn't that, yeah, that okay. didn't impress them exactly. at all actually exactly. it was really exactly. unfortunate so do you think sometimes sometimes i think um, and I mean, that's for you to, we'll, we'll open it up to you in, in just a little bit. Whether or not actually people are in a food culture, like, you know, yeah. the Mary Berry fantastic thing that's happened, um, and, uh, and are just actually going out a lot to eat, mm. and are watching every television program, and so on, but actually not cooking more or cooking yeah. better, or whether they actually are. Yeah. Do you? I, I mean, I don't know. My friends cook. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn's amazing cook. My friends cook really well. My children all my children cook and they all yeah. go they cook for each other. They go out to dinners. And I think and sometimes I look out at the River Cafe and I think, Why why aren't you home? You know, why are you all here? And you could be at home cook you know, eating and I think people there are different answers to that. Yeah. But I think I don't know, I don't know, but I know <coughs> the people around me um, cook well, like to eat well, and like their children to cook. And I cook a lot. Um, with my grandchildren now, and um, yeah. it's such a nice thing to do because it's, as you say, it's kind of, it's got an order, doesn't it? But it also has creativity. I yeah, think. well, uh, I, it, do, it does have to have an order. It's interesting. Mm. I mean, I think I cook with 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 my four year old uh, grandson, mm. and um, and for him, it's just a kind of riotous mess. But I think mm. actually, but he is actually rather, insofar as a four year old can be mm. orderly. Little Moses is, and actually mm. he absolutely loves doing it, and he has mm. a little stool in which he stands. Mm. So I think that can start really early, and this mm. is uh, this may be a kind of fairly new thing. So tell us before we throw it open. Um, quite apart from everything else, the River Cafe famously has been a kind of an academy for famous mm. names. So Hugh Fernley Whittingstall, inevitably Jamie. Um, how, I mean, did you spot? 
Jamie was going to be something extraordinary or... or I think, yeah, just... I, well, I think that, you know, you try and remember then, you know, but Jamie always was um, a curious, enthusiastic, wanting to learn, wanting to communicate. Um, great, great, you know, and, he's, and he is. He's just a wonderful yeah. person. But I also have to say there are others, I could tell you. That yeah, Harry, no, too, no, too. I've got somebody yeah. called Harry who is just, you know, and he does a pizza, he rolls it out. So he's just brilliantly, and could you, he and I've got um, Celia. We've got these great chefs, Anthea. I mean, I could name all of them who've come through. They're not Jamie. I don't know that they want to be on television. Actually, no. I don't know that they want to be. Maybe they maybe they will. Um, but they come in every day, and they think, I want to make the best ravioli you've ever had. Yeah. I'm going to. You know, we change them all around as well. Nobody comes to River Cafe and does the same thing every day for a month. That's great. So they're all learning. I think it is, it is our responsibility. And I hope that Jamie and Hugh and the Glenn who started a restaurant in Adelaide and um, Celia who went back to New Zealand. I hope, I hope that I always say when they leave and sometimes they look at you and go, it's time for me to go, Ruthie. Mm. You know, I just say as long as you keep cooking, as long as you mm. and, and also, without sounding. Point. It, you want them to take the values, you know. Um, yeah. Sean, who's my head chef, and I did the book, was said that the other day, a girl came to her with a, a burn, and Sean said, "You're going home." And she said, "I don't want to go home." And she said, "You're going home." And she said, "But I want to." She she just started. She said, "You have to go home." And she said to Sean, "Why do I have to go home?" And she said, "Because one day, you're going to be the head chef, and oh, I want yeah. you to send that person home." Oh, and I just thought wow. that was a, you know, that is what That's we also lovely. do. And I think Jamie is does it in his kitchens and mm. other, you know, so I think that mm. it's about food, but it's also about, yeah. probably didn't answer your question about Jamie. No, no, I no, know, I think, no, I was, um, I, I was naturally kind of, you know, um, I, was, I was trying to coax you into a Jamie Oliver disaster that must have happened, I think, uh, really, but in uh, my malicious way. Yeah, sure. But I will, But it wasn't quite a disaster, but I shared a cameraman, not at the same time, um, when I was doing History of Britain, and we had a wonderful guy called Luke Cardiff, who was the first cameraman to work when Jamie first was oh. went naked chef. And he said, um, he came in one day, um, and he said, well, I love Jamie, but, you know, something's happened to him. And I said, well, he said, well, he came in and um, he, he looked at what we had on the table and he said, I will not work with that tomato. <laughs> <laughs> so I he did teach said, him something. Yeah, I don't think that tomato is going to work with you, Jamie, really. Actually. I loved said, it when we were, Rose and I were once doing a, a Q&A <coughs> uh, in Cheltenham and, and at the end of the book, this is in the first book, and somebody got up and said, and we just shared questions and it was Rose's turn and somebody got up and said, other than Jamie Oliver, who's been your greatest influence? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to have heard Rose's answer. <laughs> <coughs> Can I just ask you, and then uh, I've been, keep on saying this, but I promise I will let, and I know lots of you have got questions for Ruthie. Um, uh, one thing that has happened, it's, it's not what you're doing, obviously, but um, the kind of... Um, Discovery of non-European cuisines, really, mm -hmm. um, of Asian cooking, mm -hmm. of Maghrebi cooking. Um, that strikes me as not only a wonderful thing, with some good teachers and televisions and very good cookbook writers, Nisa Hello and everybody else, mm -hmm. but it's also been paradoxically a kind of anti-globalization thing, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's been actually a force for keeping distinctiveness in, yeah. in eating. But also I think what it does um, is it, you, you know, what we want to do is welcome cultural diversity, if I dare say. You know, yeah. that you think that what has made London a better city, what has made television better, television is being shown how to cook, as you say, a, a recipe from a country we've never been to and probably may never go to, but it brings that culture to us and we try. Mm. And I think that, yeah, it's, it's hugely... Mm. Important. I love Italian food, but I like eating everything else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the last question is, which is really difficult. There have been sadnesses in your life, um, and um, you know, Rose's death, uh, sadnesses in the family, and. Uh, it seems to me absolutely kind of inconceivable people come out from the River Cafe and not feel extraordinarily happy. 
And do you think there are in some restaurants or in yours in particular? I know you're not you're not designing happiness, mm. um, but there are there are just certain ingredients of social fit, really, in some way? Or did you sure. stumble over this, which... I think it's both. I think we wanted to have a place that, as I said before, that you walked in. I really hope that when you walk into the River Cafe, you will feel taken care of. You may have had a horrible yeah. fight with your partner. You may have been fired that day. You might have had a traffic jam. All those things have, have happened to All me. those yeah. things have happened yeah. to you <laughs> on the way to a restaurant. And then you walk in and you think, you know what? Possibly you're, you're being taken care of, and also that you're home. You know, yeah. that there is a sense yeah. that I really, I talk to the people who work for us, that, you know, basically we want people to feel that it is a home. And you see, and, you know, it is interesting because you do see people coming in who, and I know they're either celebrating or they're doing something or, or, or something very sad or they are um, having a hard time. And you just wonder, you know, you know that they do very private things in what I call a very private place. People do very private things in a restaurant. People cry, people celebrate, they you know, propose, they, as, you know, and, and all this goes on. So all we wanted to do in mm. the River Cafe is create an atmosphere. You can eat really well, but yet you will, in a way, leave happier than when you left, mm. and you feel a sense of being taken care of, I hope. Yeah. You know. I have a horrible feeling once I danced around the table. Yes, the you did. Again. Yeah, we remember that. Yeah. 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 That Sorry about night. that. that when people night. left in yeah, droves, you know, say, skip the chocolate yeah, nemesis. Sharma's yeah, at it again. You know, really. I yeah. remember it very well. You were celebrating the program, weren't you? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry it was about fine. that. Yeah. It was good. You let me it in. Was good. Um, uh, everybody, um, there should be roving mics, I think, actually. Okay, so questions for Ruthie about food cooking. There's a lady in the middle. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I love cooking myself, and for me, it's a way of, sort of showing love to family and friends. I made my best friend's wedding cake. I'm about to make a cake probably in about too much short time for my son's birthday, but I couldn't imagine buying a cake. But I see so many people and young people who've either got a fear of trying new foods or cooking itself. Do you think that we could be doing more, or is it just something that is a way of the current culture? Well, I, you know, I would say that it, um, it starts very young. Uh, one of the great photographs I have is a photograph of um, a menu at an Ecole Maternelle in Paris. And it shows you the menu. It's a state school. And it shows you the menus for the week. And it has, you know, they start off with a little pate, and then they had a celery remoulade, and then they had a daube of beef and cheese, and then a dessert. And I thought, that says something about a culture that is investing in their in young children and and I think that's where it starts so I think that you know yes food cooking growing vegetables <laughs> understanding sustainability is part of our investment into our culture and I think it's disgraceful the way our country um, this country ign ignores and probably my you know America as well just ignores that and uh, feeds children terrible food Hello. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask whether you, because you're a bit of a trailblazer, believe it or not, I think, um, particularly with women in, in the kitchen and, you know, at the top of their game. Do you think that women are still underrepresented uh, in the sort of restaurateur business? Um, I would say women are unrepresented, period. Yeah, I think definitely we are. It's getting better in every profession, whether it's journalism or banking or architecture or being a lawyer. So I think we are, it is what it is now, and we are getting better. And I think when I first, the, the restaurant business um, was very male-dominated. Kitchens were very male-dominated. Uh, I would say that when I first tried on a pair of chef's trousers, they were so uncomfortable, and I called up laundry in my outrage and said, why? And they said, well, because they're, they're designed for men. And I think now, um, you know, it, the River Cafe, uh, always, we never have less than 50% women in the kitchen. Would I like more? Yes. Would we have, but we, you know, I think it's really exciting now to see the number of women chefs who are, are working in the kitchen. April Bloomfield was that? April was it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. And she's a real force in, yeah. in New York, yeah. actually, in her yeah. own right. Yeah. And yeah, she's another great. trailblazer. Um, uh, yes, gentlemen down here. Can I 
ask about the mismatch between this ethereal food and environment and the customers, many of whom are extremely prosaic and often can be, how can I put it, somewhat boorish. Is this not something that is this mismatch between the two sides of whatever you do that is a, becomes an issue at any point? Hang on a moment. Yeah. You, mean, you mean the customers in the River Cafe? <laughs> Absolutely, I'm talking about it. Oh, I'm sorry. General, I'm talking about the general. I'm not talking about particularly the River Cafe, but the uh, fact is that all this endeavour has gone into uh, this a wonderful food preparation, and yet very often oh, yeah, one can yeah. see customers who are, how can I put it, behaving less than their best, uh, both in the quality of the way they behave and the food, the way they treat the out, food. Actually. No, I don't. No, actually, doesn't. I have to say that the people, you know, I don't want to sound, again, just a very positive person, but the people that eat in the River Cafe are great. You know, they come up, they talk to me, they, they I know, you know their children come up and talk to us. They are understanding if we're too busy and we didn't get their food out on time. They leave on time. They are nice to our waiters. I, I actually can count on my fingers the times um, that I've actually had somebody who um, was uh, really unpleasant. Uh, sometimes I was saying today, sometimes a waiter will come up and say, we have a difficult table. You know, we have a difficult table. You know, we don't, there's no such thing. You know, you can turn people around, you know. And, you know, sometimes people, we, we really let, we let people down. You know, we're, we haven't cooked something well enough or the waiter hasn't served it properly or whatever it is. And I find that there's a way of kind of work. you know, we're all working together. I, I, I have, I don't have that problem, I don't think. I, I tell you, I, I don't know what you think, but I think, I do know what you mean, actually, despite me being a bit facetious earlier, but I tell you my particular bugbear, which I think actually causes people to go animal, um, and that's um, sound problems. Yeah. Uh, I had my way on restaurant guides, there would be, um, you know, a loudspeaker sign for, for humane to deafening, kind of basically Led Zeppelin strength, and as the sound thing, very hard mm. surfaces, as you know, the kind of laughter, shouty thing, it, it, it all becomes exponential, doesn't it? So everybody, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've been to re uh, restaurants, then wake up the next morning thinking, my God, I've got this awful cold, so I have a terrible sore throat, but I've been screaming to make myself heard. And then it's compounded with hideous music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, it, it, you'll know the River Cafe, all of you, but I'm glad we should start a movement here. Um, for quiet, eat, relatively quiet eating, because actually you can't be happy and you can't have a family feeling with friends or actual family in those circumstances. And it's become absolutely brutal. And I have to say, some restaurant managements, when you say even turn the music down, saying impossible, they like it this way. And I think that contributes to this kind of raw feeling that you sometimes get. And as you know, Riff Cafe is a beautiful space, but somehow I don't, maybe it was Richard, maybe it was you two, but actually you. You're not deafened and screaming and shouting and, you know, the clatter oh, factor. Yeah, yeah. No, it isn't really. Okay, so, yes, gentlemen. No. If you really had to choose a meal, what would be your, mm. your favourite, favourite uh, meal in terms of appetiser, main course and dessert? Uh, what a great question. That's a hard question. <laughs> um, well, I've been asked that, you know, so I'm a little prepared, I have to say. But I think that when people ask me what would be, sometimes I say, what would be your desert island um, dish? What would be your um, you know, last meal on earth or whatever? And I'm afraid I, I may disappoint you, but I always say slow-cooked tomato pasta. You know, I just love mm. tomato pasta. I think they're great pastas. But right now we're doing uh, tagliarini with white truffles, or we're doing clams with um, tagliatelle, or we're doing gnocchi alla romana. We're doing so many different things, and um, I love all those pastas, but there's something about just a slow-cooked tomato, really cooked for a long time with basil and uh, exceptionally good tagliarini. I like it with tagliarini. I don't like it so much with spaghetti. I don't like it so much with the hard pasta. So I'd say that. How one. about pudding, though? I mean, you know, <laughs> pudding, caramel ice cream. Yeah, you? yeah, I think so. Mm, yes, yeah. yes. I love ice cream. Yes, I, on ice cream. Um, how many of you have got ice cream machines? Whoa, not enough, folks. It'll change your life, really. It may expand you a little bit, but not necessarily 
go out and invest in one and don't get the kind that you need to stick in the freezer actually because then you're stuck with one flavor and they're, they're aggravating but they're cheap but invest in i don't know 150 quid in yeah. the sort that have their own condenser freezer built in and you can do what do the 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 caramel ice cream but you could you you know yes. yeah yes. don't try pistachio ice cream though actually and i'm mr pistachio i love almost everything but you have to blanch the little buggers actually to get the skins <laughs> off and that gets rid of the flavor you were trying to trap in the first place so don't don't do that but that will that will change your life there's a lady there yeah oh, wait for the mic love. Sorry. okay um, Ruthie, I was going to ask you, apart from family and... Okay. Hi. 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 <laughs> apart from family and friends, um, who I know would always be top of your list, who are the dream guests that you'd have around a table at the River Cafe? Oh. Um, that's, that's hard. Sorry, I'll yeah. take that back then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that you really... I love cooking in the River Cafe, certainly, for the people who come over and over again, the, the people who are really part of the River Cafe family who know that they've had something before and they want it again, people who, I'm looking at you all here, um, whose children are eating. And I, I just find that so touching that people want to come back to the restaurant and feel it's kind of home. Um, I would love to cook for Obama, if you want to know. Good you know and people, I'd be very happy if you walked into the restaurant tomorrow at lunchtime. Yes, sir. Lady there. Then I'll, I'll come to you, sir. No, I, did, oh, I just wanted to ask, um, obviously we all, I think, love the River Cafe, but it's very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, I wanted to get your opinion on whether you think there's a place or more of a place for affordable eating with that kind of ingredients and freshness. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I would, you know, I, I, would, I would, I've thought about it. I've tried to start one, a place that could be um, good ingredients, um, and you'd have to change quite a lot of the way that we cook and the way, not, not the way we cook, but the way we run our kitchen. But I think it's definitely possible. <coughs> and I also would say that you could come to the River Cafe and have, um, you know, I would never mind if somebody came and had a salad and a pasta. That's absolutely fine. You can sit there for three hours. Um, I think that it's, uh, it, it's, just, it's hard because, I think, as I say, there are people... When people leave the River Cafe, we've rarely had anybody say I was ripped off, you know, or this is too expensive, or how dare you. But they might not come back for a while because they can't, you know. And I think that when I... You know, we could we could talk about this for hours. When I see the price of turbot, we don't have a freezer. We we get everything fresh. The the you know we throw things away. The staff eat what's left over. We do a. I sound like I'm, am I being defensive? I hope not. Uh, but I, I just would like to explain that you know we sit at a blank piece of paper every morning, at eight o'clock, and then every afternoon at three, and we design the menu. And you know we're very professional. We have to figure it out. But um, would I like to have a less expensive restaurant? Yes, I would. Yeah. That was, you, you, yes. There's, there's a, there, there's a young lady here, yeah. In row three, there we go. Thank you. Hi. Hi, darling. Um, mine this is not a really a question, question. <laughs> it's more an acknowledgement. Um, oh. I guess to explain the magic of the River Cafe for many of the regulars, uh, beyond the delicious food uh, and the changing menu twice a day, which is very unusual, I think the magic can be explained very much to the ethos um, of kindness and generosity, not just towards the customers, but you know, very much towards the staff as well. Everybody has a story about you know, how they might have a passion outside the River Cafe, which might be to write a novel. You know, Ruth will give them time off, you know, same page, just to write that novel. So that's why it's such a happy place, because in a, in a cutthroat world where everyone's very commercial, there's a happy place where you don't just make business decisions, you nurture people, and I think that's... That's the magic of the River Cafe and the feeling there that it's a little oasis of Fine. kindness. <laughs> I've heard Gordon Ramsay say the same. Not, not. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, yeah, I, I think, I'll just defend George Gordon a little bit. Because sure. I think that he is a television chef. And actually, if you, I haven't worked in his kitchen, but I know people have. And I think he's actually probably quite a kind person. I've. I do. Yes, I, I think, was. I think was, a uh, lot of that. I, I, I wish he didn't do what he did for our profession. I think that 
was not great. And I think his attitudes, I think he's changed, but um, you know, his approach to bullying or that was, I think a lot of it is good TV. I think, I don't think he's like that. No? Well, I think incompetent <laughs> cruelty is not particularly good TV in my view. <laughs> then, but then, don't quote me. <laughs> yeah, um. there. You know, people often say that food binds people together. You know, that families who eat together are stronger for it. And I'd just love to hear you on that. And also that it seems to me that in the phonetic kind of 24-7 world, people are talking and thinking about food more. Hmm. And is that because something's happening that they need Oh, you don't have the mic, do you? I'm sorry. Um, shall I repeat the sure. question? I'd love to hear how you repeat that. Uh, <laughs> you should answer that. You could answer that question. Well, family... I think, I think uh, Simon should answer that yeah, question. Yeah, it's about whether it, the food um, binds you together as a family and it's one place, really, where family c come together. We, we felt that... My, I, my wife and I felt that very much with our... Children, but my—I I didn't have quite the experience of Ruthie when I was growing up. We were in it. Uh, um, my mother was an enthusiastic, but pretty appalling kosher cook, um, and um, and she she her one of her life's. Uh, she was a wonderful woman, I have to say, in many other ways. She wasn't cut out for the kitchen, and I knew this actually when my, when the. Uh, a, a clop, a kind of kind of kosher meatloaf was produced, and my mother said, "There'll be one of these which will have a very small piece of my index finger in it, but you know, <laughs> you won't notice." And it was true that really, and um, and uh, and we we had because it was you know a kosher Jewish family um, rows occur, but they were kind of loving rows, you know. Mm. Should this time of year. Um, because we, we were a family of so-called Sephardi trash. So should you have your sweet and sour sauce with stuffed cabbage or should it be vine leaves, you know, as my father always wanted? My mother was on a mission, really. She felt the world was going downhill with the popularity of garlic. She was... Um, and But my father had the opposite view. So my mother's compromise was on what we call the Friday night memorial chicken, which is a kind of ashen thing. One lonely clove of garlic garlic would rattle around. However, this did, in, in a matter of celebration, when there was something to celebrate it and complain, did indeed bind the family together. And I, I think you're right. I think, I, I think I, it's, yeah. The, your point was in, in a kind of mayhem, you know, and little Sharon's got to have a Suzuki violin lesson and, you know, Joey's got to sort of do his football and something, actually. That coming together. Also, I do think, did you find this, that actually... The ma one of the things about the magic of um, a good family supper is your children talk to you. Yeah, but I think we have to be to just, them. I'm always a little bit wary of this because I think that we're talking about a certain kind of family or a certain kind of economic vision. Yeah. And I think that if you've been working all day and maybe you're on the day shift and maybe your husband's on the night shift and mm. maybe the kids haven't come back until seven and they're with their friends or, you know, it's, it's um, the I. Uh, you know, it, it'd be really hard to get a family to sit down together. You know, mm. it might be really hard to say, we're all going to participate in this meal um, because the pressures are so great. And I think, you know, a lot of kids are going up to do their homework. Or the, as I said, it's, 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 I think the happy family is happy. Or it's a great, great thing. I th totally believe in, in having a dinner. But I also think, and I've also heard stories where the family dinner could be tyranny, you know, that you could mm. sit there and nobody spoke, or you could sit there and people were across, and you would sit there and you wanted to be doing something else, mm. but you had to sit at dinner. So I think it's important, but I also think that the romanticization of it can also be slightly mm. negative. I think it can be, and we want it to be, what we're all thinking of, mm. that wonderful, like your family, my family, even if fighting, all of us sitting in this room. But I think the pressures are enormous for a lot of families. Yeah, that's, that's very thoughtfully put. There was um, one of my favorite television series in America, which only was, I think, one or two seasons, called My So-Called Life. It launched Claire Danes. As a t if you can catch it, um, do in a, call the teenager, 16-year-old called 15-year-old called Angela. And it's, and it's all done in internal interior monologue. And the family is sitting around having such a supper. And um, the mother says, um, Angela, darling, would you pass the salt? And the first thing you hear out of Claire Nades' mouth, uh, quite often I want to stab my mother through the chest with this fork, actually, which is so... Uh, 
That, mm. Not something that will ever happen at the, <laughs> at the River Cafe. So, Ruthie, thank you for thank a you. wonderful feast. <laughs> of, um, and I just want to... Rather crucially, I want to add that um, Ruthie will be signing Simon copies of the book. Uh, I'm going to be signing uh, copies of Belonging, my Come new on. book, Good. in a book in a bookstore right now as well. 